consider an example with some numbers here. Let's consider a demand curve where quantity demanded is equal to 50 minus 5p, and a supply curve where quantity supplied is equal to negative 6 plus 3p. We can think about what these look like on our graph, and we'll notice that our quantity axis intercept is where price is equal to zero. If price is zero, quantity is 50, so our demand curve comes down at 50 here. And our price axis intercept is where quantity equals zero. So if zero is equal to 50 minus 5p, that means that our price axis intercept here is at a price of 10. Similarly, our price axis intercept for our supply curve is where the quantity supplied is exactly equal to zero. So if zero is equal to negative six plus three times p, that happens where p is two. And we can see that our supply curve starts at a price of two here. The first thing that we want to do, because it gives us something to compare to, is to say, well, what's the free market outcome in terms of price and quantity? So like always, our free market outcome is where quantity demanded and quantity supplied come together, or at the point where 50 minus 5p is equal to negative 6 plus 3p. Doing a little bit of algebra, we see that that happens where 8p is equal to 56, or where p is equal to 7. So our free market equilibrium price is at 7. And our free market equilibrium quantity is just found by plugging 7 back into either of our equations. And that happens where Q is 15. So our free market equilibrium quantity is 15. Now let's say that we put a price floor in place at a price of 9. First of all, because 9 is bigger than 7, we know that this price floor is going to be binding. And we can say, we're setting this price floor here at a price of 9. At a price of 9, how many units of the item are demanded? Well, we can see that by just plugging a price of 9 into our demand equation. You can say, well, 50 minus 5 times 9 is equal to 5. So our quantity demanded here is equal to 5. Our quantity supplied at a price of 9 is just negative 6 plus 3 times 9 from this equation here is equal to 21. So our quantity supplied at our price floor of 9 is 21. And we define our surplus as quantity supplied minus quantity demanded in this case, because supply is the one that's bigger. So our surplus is defined by 21 minus 5, which is equal to 16. So you'll see, given the numbers here, we define our surplus as 16, but it's important to remember that the actual quantity transacted of the item goes down from 15 to 5. All this surplus says is that if the firms could sell as much as they wanted at the price floor price, they would want to supply 21 units. Unfortunately, at the price floor price, only five units are being demanded, so these firms have to figure out who gets the privilege of producing those five units and selling them at this price. Just like with price ceilings, there are two factors that affect the size of the surplus that we get when we're talking about a price floor. The first factor is elasticity, or how steep or shallow the supply and demand curves are. You'll notice here that when we have more inelastic supply and demand, our surplus is smaller than we ha when we have flatter or more elastic supply and demand. Here, we've drawn two price floors that are the same amount away from the original equilibrium price. The only difference is that we have lower elasticity of supply and demand here and higher elasticity of supply and demand here. And that higher elasticity leads to a bigger surplus. The other factor that affects the size of the surplus that results is the size of the price increase. So in this first case, the price floor is placed just a small distance away from the free market equilibrium price. 
And in the second case, everything is the same, except that we've placed the price floor further away from that free market equilibrium price. And we'll notice that the closer the price floor is to the free market outcome, the smaller our surplus is. So we get a smaller surplus here and a larger surplus here. This is useful to think about because we're not always concerned only about whether or not there is a surplus, but we want to think at various levels of specificity about how large that surplus is going to be and exactly how much we're dis distorting the market by putting a price floor in place. As a final point, let's take a second to compare and contrast a price ceiling and a price floor. You'll notice here that both price ceilings and price floors reduce the equilibrium quantity transacted of a product. With the price ceiling, the quantity transacted goes down because your limiting factor is supply. With the price floor, your equilibrium quantity transacted goes down because your limiting factor is demand. But in either case, in terms of quantity, we see the same outcome. On the other hand, when we're thinking about the price that occurs, with a price ceiling, we get a decrease in price from our free market outcome price. Whereas with a price floor, not surprisingly, we get an increase in equilibrium price from our free market outcome. So when deciding what to do in terms of policy, you want to think about not only do we get the quantity reduction that we are looking for, but do we get the quantity reduction via a price increase or a price decrease? It's a little bit counterintuitive to ever want to put a price floor in place because one of the questions that people could ask is, well, why are you resorting to raising the price in order to limit the quantity when you could be lowering the, the price to limit the quantity instead? Because this inherently seems to favor the producers of a product over the consumers of a product and just intuitively for whatever reason that's typically frowned upon. Say, so, well, why, why ever would you choose to enact a price floor rather than a price ceiling unless you were specifically wanting to help the producers, which in some cases is a reasonable option? The justification in some cases for putting a price floor in place is that by pushing the price higher rather than lower, you're excluding certain groups of people from purchasing. In the cigarettes example, you can think about the higher prices being a deterrent to younger customers for example, purchasing the product and getting addicted, or at least that's the theory. So in that case, saying, well, we're trying to put a higher price in place rather than a lower price might be reasonably appealing.